In the early days, they rang bells in most places. Uh, Cincinnati in particular had a great big drum. They would beat the drum. The, uh, by the beats, they could tell where the fire was. The first volunteer firefighters were in Boston, but they wasn't organized. The first volunteer fire department was organized by Benjamin Franklin in 1736. It was the Union Fire Company. In England, you had uh, paid fire departments hired by the insurance companies. In the United States, you didn't have that. They were all volunteers from the beginning. And why would you have volunteers? Bucket brigades and so forth. If your neighbor's house was on fire, if you were friendly and you, most people were friends in those days, you would be ashamed of not putting your, helping put a fire out. Fire! Fire! <laughs> there was a fire in 1700s. Everybody was required to have two buckets in the household. When the fire warden would come down the street and yell fire, the, the buckets would be thrown outside the house. Uh, the firefighters would pick the buckets up going to the fire and use the, le the leather buckets. They would always carry a bed key with them before they went into the fire. The bed key was used to take the bed apart, which was the most important piece of furniture in the house. In 1730, uh, Philadelphia and New York ordered two fire uh, piece apparatus from England. It was a little hand pumper, not much longer than five or six foot long. And the water was put into the tub, and it was pumped by hand by two to four men. Then you had double-deck fire engines came into being. And by a double-deck, it means putting someone up on top that would be able to pump also. So he started with four men up on top and six men or eight men down the bottom. So you'd have 10 or 12 men pumping an engine. When you were pumping with a hand engine, you'd pump maybe 30, 40 strokes a minute. Within three minutes, you were totally exhausted you had to replace it with a new crew. Beside the fact you pulled the fire engine by hand to the fire grounds. They didn't use horses in the early days. So you had men exhausted from pulling it to the fire. You had men exhausted within three minutes from pumping. So you had, a, you had to have a big crew to keep replacing the men. And they used this type of engine clean up until the days of steam. The first steam engine was made in Cincinnati by a, by a man by the name of Ladder. This was the coming of paid fire departments, actually. You had a big population in the fire companies. Let's take Philadelphia, for instance. You had 92 fire companies in, a, in, a, in Philadelphia. They had two to 900 members in each company. They caused a lot of rowdyism. The firefighters were on their own, but they were reimbursed by the insurance companies for fighting fires. So they always wanted to be there first. The first company in would get the lion's share of the money. So they would fight to get there first. They would fight over fire hydrants and so forth. And then when steam came in, this was the solution of why get rid of the fire department. You didn't need as many men. You didn't have to pay. You'd pay a few men to do the work of many men. kick butt because <laughs> last week we had to lose because of this guy getting oh, his yeah. eyeballs blown out. <laughs> Back to you, Tolly. The community definitely does not know what we do. Uh, because the reason I say that is because after every fire we get, receive a letter from the dwelling saying we never knew how important it was to have that fire company there. Uh, they never thought about it because they had no need to think about it. And the time came that they needed us. They called a phone number, which they never called before. They talked to a man that they never talked to before. And it's a, it's a radio dispatch. And within minutes, all of a sudden, there's a fire company, which a lot of them don't even know who we are, where we're coming from. Uh, we're there. We do the job. 
we clean up and we're gone. They don't even know that we're volunteer. They think we get paid. Like half the people that I've talked to about being a firefighter, oh, you're not paid? You don't, you don't get paid for it? I'm like, no, it's all volunteer. Oh, well, why do you do it then? They, don't, they can't understand why somebody would want to volunteer to risk their life. <laughs> Cancer people, you never keep them happy. Uh, you know, you spend 45 minutes cutting somebody out of a wreck in the street and you've got 10 people leaning out of a car screaming at you because they can't get home on time. You know, we had here was your, your basic kitchen fire. Uh, they had grease on the stove. They left it unattended. Uh, the grease hit its flashpoint, it ignited. The fire spread up across the cabinets. Uh, here's I can tell the homeowner must have tried to get the grease to the and sustained some light burns and dropped the grease and then ignited across the rest of the kitchen. You never know from one moment to another when your call is going to come, of course. And uh, if you're really interested and uh, in any way dedicated, it means that you're going to drop what you're doing, jump and go. We went three years in a row that I never saw midnight on New Year's Eve. and. Uh, each time we were all dressed up, we were out at occasions, and uh, between 10 and 11.30, we had major fires, and uh, we happened to be close enough that, that I responded to them. Uh, one, it was about 11.30, they were giving out door prizes, and everybody was getting all hopped up for New Year's Eve, and the party was really in full swing, and it was a real nice affair. And, and uh, by the time I got back, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, I had a new suit that was totally ruined, uh, smelled like I'd been drugged through a burn-up warehouse, and uh, it really it ruined the entire evening. And uh, it took her a couple days to get over that one. We're going to spray underneath the car as we go to keep the gas tank cooled down, and then we'll open up the, the door if we can. It takes a lot of time because you have to go to training. I missed my birthday this year because of training, because I had to go to fire school, and I was exhausted, so I couldn't even go out for dinner. Stay down low. Stay down. One of the toughest things I found to get used to was the protective clothing. Boots, special pants, special coat, gloves, Nomex hood and this helmet weigh about 20 pounds altogether. Add to that the self-contained breathing apparatus and you're carrying about 55 pounds around on your back. The idea is not to have anything exposed to the outside air or to the flames. Once that's done, you're ready for fire school. We're gonna have a nozzle crew responsible for attacking the fire and a search and rescue crew that will be searching the basement to make sure there's no victims involved. When the search crew comes in, they will use the available light from the fire in order to see. After they have searched the area, the suppression crew then will suppress the fire with a hose line that they have brought with them. Notice that the hose line is being put into place and that the search and rescue crew will now sweep around the room. The volunteer that's out there doing this as a service to his community uh, has to have a, a good head on his shoulders so he can think quickly. He is absorbing a lot of technical information nowadays. Uh, they are responding to many new things such as the hazmat, but we've got new things that are out with the bloodborne pathogens such as hepatitis B and AIDS that they have to allow for and be aware of when they're doing rescue work. Uh, so they are a different breed really nowadays than what we would have thought uh, 25, 30 years ago. We used to go past the firehouse and they're sitting out front and they're maybe playing checkers and the dog's sitting there beside them and it looked like it was just a nice place